And um, now, as you guys know, like uh, just to go through my my. But you know, my um, I've been singing since I was uh, 16. Uh, I'm 46. I self-taught myself, and wow. uh, which was not a good idea. And uh, uh, my first record was in '99, and I'm releasing my eighth record uh, today. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've done a lot of shows out on wow. the road. Uh, dealt with a lot of adversity with my voice. So um, I have a lot of knowledge that I've built up through trial and error. So. Um, uh, the voice is uh, interesting, you know. Um, I don't know how many of you guys are doing it like on a regular basis uh, for a living or just on a weekend warriors or, or whatever, but um, um, when I started out, I went to a vocal coach and I said, hey, you know, um, I want to learn how to sing. And she's like, okay, go, go home and... and learn every breath you take. She didn't even like start me off on like vocal scales or anything and um, I wasn't really interested in, in learning that song. But when I look back on it, I wish I would have because you know, learning any kind of song is just good. Sometimes you find new things out about your voice that you didn't know about because you're learning somebody else's melodies, somebody else's range, you're trying to cop it and um, you learn a lot. But I was, uh, was kind of I was really obsessed with this record, Back in Black, at the time, and um, I wanted to sing like Brian Johnson, and uh, <laughs> so I brought him Back in Black, and she said, uh, oh, I'm sorry, but we don't, we don't teach that here. And I said, um, okay, thanks, and that was it, and I just never went back and um, proceeded to just kind of um, do my thing, you know, and uh, in order to get the texture I wanted, I would really put my voice through a lot of unnecessary uh, trauma. You know what I mean? And um, that was easy to do when you're a teenager and you're in your early 20s, you can beat the shit out of yourself and usually not get into some trouble, you know? But um, after my first record, I was blowing my voice out a lot. This is before in-ear monitors. Um, I was having a really hard time even hearing my voice because of the fucking cymbals and I was in a lot of clubs and, uh, and I just got off the road and I was really fatigued vocally and tired and I needed help, you know? And so um, I went to a vocal coach and they're like, well, there's these things called vocal scales. And I'm like, oh, what are those? What is that all about? And I, you know, he couldn't believe that I'd been through, I got a record deal and toured and I'd done all this without vocal scales, you know? I would do like uh, my own kind of warm up thing where I'd, I'd kind of get my body hot, you know, with, with the, you know, my energy and my, my wind. And um, I would kind of, you know, sing a little bit and then go on and do it, but it wasn't, that was stupid, you know. So long story short, you got, you got these two little vocal folds, right? And um, they just come together and they come apart and they come together and they come apart and they vibrate and that's how you make sound. So like the vocal scales really help you concentrate on technique and What's great about that is not slamming your voice together with a lot of wind, right? And that's what I was doing. When you're doing that, you're really fucking uh, working overtime. You're doing a lot of damage. And that's how you can get polyps and nodes and all that kind of stuff. And so um, the vocal scales kind of teach you, first of all, how to sing on key because they're done with pianos, so you piano scales. And um, so it teaches you how to hit the notes on key how, what you need to be focused on, which are vowels. You know, you want your voice to be open. You don't want to, you don't want to be clinching down on your on your uh, your notes because that's what will cause fatigue and problems and all that kind of stuff. You know, so a lot of the singers that I really liked were uh, had very bad vocal technique. Brian Johnson. Uh, I was really into like all my early records were punk rock records like Black Flag and Seven Seconds and shit like that where guys are just like going for it, right? Henry they were, Rollins. Is yeah, Henry great. Rollins is just taking a mic and, and it was awesome <clears throat> and inspiring, but you know, there wasn't a whole lot of vocal technique going on. So um, I had a lot of bad habits when I finally got to a vocal coach and um, I wasn't very open-minded at that point either. And so I had to really learn a lot because I was at a point where I didn't want to keep doing what I was doing because it was physically taxing on me, you know? And so I figured out how to 
get more out of my voice by using less wind and less energy, um, which is which is what you want to do, you know? So if you study like, that's why I like to really watch pop artists sing because most of them are very um, technically sound, you know? They hold the mic right, they're hitting their notes right because they've been taught since they were little kids to be a pop star, most of them, you know? So it's interesting to me, you know? So um, the first thing that I learned that I was doing wrong was I was like gripping my mic really hard and like I can just feel like when I grip it hard and the adrenaline's flowing and the crowd's in there, yeah, and it, it just, it tightens up your larynx and you run into problems. So one thing I had to start learning was to just, I brought a, this pocket. is how crazy I am. I don't, I don't want to like talk on a mic that's not my own. That's one thing I don't do <laughs> ever because I don't want to get sick. Anyways, um, I just hold the mic like this now, you know, and I get right on it and I'm not afraid of my voice. I want to hear all the imperfections. So I have my, my in-ear monitors in, and in-ear monitors for me were like, it was like a godsend. It was like, oh my God, thank you. Like, I was so kind of afraid to get into it because I'd used floor monitors, and my tour manager just said, well, here you go, we got, I got them, and he's like, we got it, this is it. And I had to, I had to literally do it in front of people. I didn't even have time to rehearse with it because we were out on the road, and I was really scared. But then I did it, and it was amazing because I don't know if you guys have used in your monitors, but yeah. if you're going to sing uh, a lot, it, it's the best investment you can do as a singer. Can as I ask which earphones you're using? I use uh, Ultimate Ears, okay. and I only have two drivers. I don't have like the crazy four Because yeah, I've got that sh know. the Shore ones that's got the three drivers. and. Uh, are they molded though? No. Oh, you they're, gotta get molded. They're off the track. If they're not molded, it's shit because you get a lot of outside noise, and you, it's about the clarity. You get them molded, and it just sucks yeah. everything up, and then you only put in what you want, right? And the more you put in, the harder it is to hear your voice. So what I do is right now I'm in a four-piece rock band, and I just have kick, snare, hat, right, toms, and then guitar. And bass, that's it. I don't have any backup vocals. I don't have any crowd noise. I don't want anybody fucking... I, want, I can hear the crowd enough because my, yeah. my, my vocal mic is pretty hot because I want to just touch it. I don't want to have to push to hear my voice. I don't want to push all this air to hear myself. I just want to barely touch it. So you guys want to EQ your voice just enough so you can get a nice sound all through your range, but you're just touching it. You know what I mean? So... You're just touching the notes. You're not like loading up on your notes with all this wind, you know? Um, I don't know if you remember the show you did a couple weeks ago in Dallas. You had a problem with your in air. I think yes. the battery died, and then your tech came out. And a lot of water it. came in and shorted it out, and I had spare ears. Is that have, what happened? Yeah. Sometimes uh, you're sweating a lot, and it'll get in, and okay. your driver will go out, and then you gotta have spare so ears. So have a backup ready to you go. You just put yeah. spare ears in and go, you know? But, uh, do you yeah. find that you sing harder um, or softer because you can hear what you're doing? Softer, softer yeah. Softer? Okay, then how do you do that with hey, the have texture? Have you ever watched Prince sing? About? Have you ever watched Prince sing? He sings and he's like pulling and he's just barely touching his notes. Like if you were to sit side stage, you could barely hear him, you know? And he used to have really a lot of issues with monitor guys because they it, it drives him nuts because they got to adjust his volume in the mix up and down all night long because he's doing this shit. He's using these mics that have these big... <coughs> it all depends. Like like a 58, you got to eat it yeah. in order to hear it. You get right. just off at a second and your voice is gone, you know? But some mics you can put well, on here. I got here. KSM8, which has... Yeah, the, yeah. It's got suit. everything. I yeah. hate that shit. I don't want to hear all this shit through my mic, yeah, you know? Yeah, like so I'd rather eat it and then I get a lot more separation. I figured if it was more sensitive, I wouldn't have to drive as hard, plus it's got more sweet It all depends on what works for you, and you, yeah. you gotta try out a lot of different mics, all vocalists are different, so I'm just telling you what works for me, but yeah, you know, Nothing there's... Nothing beats a 58. The, yeah. I like the 58 because it's cheap, <laughs> yep. yeah, and you can works. hammer it in with a nail, so you can be really uh, destructive with it, and it still works, and I'm pretty, you know, energetic, destructive guy sometimes on stage, so I like it. And I've had wireless mics and all kinds of mics, and I always come back to this because I want a wired mic because I, I just like the way wired mics sound. I, I, you, you get a little, you just jump? a little bit of difference when you, when you start getting off the wire, and I don't like it. And they're like, well, you don't have as much freedom moving around, and I go, 
Yeah, I'll work with it. I'll figure it out. Yeah, the wireless you know? doesn't have as much balls to it as like. But, but you dance with the wire either. a lot. You know. What's that? You dance with the wire. You know, you kind of made it part of you. Yeah, you just make it part, like of part, stick, part of your stick or do yeah. whatever. You know. Um, but anyway, so like the way you hold your mic is really important. You know, you, you want to stand up straight with your diaphragm. A lot of people get in these habits where they're like, uh, uh, and doing all this shit. It's just like. Way. It, you know, eventually you're gonna run into problems. So, I mean, as far as like rock, rock artists, you know. Um, so I, I encourage you guys all to to if if you love singing, you know, be open open to every genre of music and kind of watch everybody's vocal technique, how they're holding their mic, how they're hitting their notes, what they're doing with their mouths, and you know, especially pop artists, like I said, because they're really technically sound. Uh, uh, People who sing opera, really interesting to watch, you know, because they're doing this stuff all the time. Um, th the thing with vocal scales now is um, when you get older, your voice fatigues quicker. You know what I mean? It's it, My voice has changed. When I hit 30, it was like, oh my God, it was like a whole different set of circumstances. So I had to work a little harder and I started figuring out, like, through my vocal mm -hmm. coach, like, Oh, um, you should do vocal scales on your days off. And I'm like, what? And he goes, yeah. Just because he calls doing vocal scales vocalizing. It's not singing. And he's right. It's not singing. So uh, on my days off, like before I came here, I did vocal scales because I do them every day because I'm singing all the time. When I don't do them, it's a lot. I can, I can tell that I don't have the flexibility. My voice gets more fatigued quicker. So I just do it every day. You know what I mean? It's just part of my life until I'm not going to be a singer anymore. That's what I'm going to do. So um, even when I get up, I get up and your voice is like the worst it's going to be when you wake up because your vocal cords, cords swell when you sleep and that's why you're always like husky voice and groggy in the morning because of that. Um, so when I get up, I don't even like to talk to anybody. I want to go outside. I want to just... Mm, I just hum, um, kind of get my voice to just kind of get all the phlegm off my voice, mm -hmm. and all the you know the morning shit, and then, and then finally I can say, hi, you know I don't like to talk to anybody in the morning for a good half hour anyways, <laughs> but like everybody knows that when I go on the road you know but um, so um, that's that um, one thing that was never taught to me that, um, is like. What you eat is really important to singing. I was about to you know? ask that if you had any rituals or habits as far as things well, you drink or eat. A huge problem with people who sing a lot is acid reflux because we're always oh, using our God, diaphragm, have that. our diaphragm, right? And uh, some of us have really bad eating habits, like we eat a lot of you know pasta or stuff with you know spicy foods or you know red sauce and all all the good stuff, the fun stuff. You know, um, me personally. I can't operate I, like I have a crazy situation for singing, um, which is um, I don't drink any cold beverages. I don't drink any carbonated beverages. I don't, uh, when I'm on tour, I don't eat any uh, red sauce, um, spicy food. I don't eat uh, two hours before going to bed. You know, all these things create problems and they're gonna they're gonna fatigue your voice if you have all this acid sitting in your throat while you're sleeping all night so another thing that's really bad is taking Prilosec or fucking Zantax or all that shit I'm doing horrible that shit. for you so what I figured out so so what's the answer Josh well the answer is um, uh, baking soda get baking soda from the store very cheap you know take a tablespoon put it in your water mix it up a little bit of water Drink it every couple hours, or if, if you don't feel like, if it, you feel like you're clearing your <clears throat> voice a lot, that's acid reflux. Start just taking it every couple hours until it like mellows out. I always like to drink a little, you know, drink a bit before I go to sleep. A little, a little of that before I lay down, just because if there's anything in there, I just want it to cool out so I can sleep. Very important. Um, was never taught to me. I had to figure out that the hard way. Um, what else? So yeah, so this is this is how fun being a singer is. Uh, another thing, drugs and alcohol. Don't recommend it. You know, I've been sober since I was 23. I've been sober 23 years, and it was because 
I had a really bad problem with drugs and alcohol, you know, and and I've been singing since I was 16. So like, we know the song. I did I did shows <laughs> I did a lot of shows fucked up, and um, I've seen video footage of me when I was you know fucked up, and it, it was embarrassing, you know, and you think you're fucking killing it, but you're not. You're horrible, and you're not achieving anything that you want to achieve, and it's. Uh, there's just greatness. You don't need that. If if you like, even if let's say you're great, loaded, you're gonna be so much better. Fucking not loaded. So, if you like to party, cool. Just try to do it after you're singing because all that stuff can fuck your voice up too. Like if you're doing blow and you sing, you can't feel your vocal cords. Your vocal cords are numb. You don't even know what's going on. So you could be doing all kinds of damage. You don't know it till that shit wears off in the morning and you can't even speak. Same thing with you know, smoking or fucking whatever. But everybody has their thing, you know? Some guys can fucking smoke like chimneys and sing great their whole lives, like John Cougar. I mean, the guy's still singing well. I can't believe it, but, you know, and he's got a thing, and it's like, fuck. And sometimes I sometimes I watch these guys. It just wasn't my path, but, like, you know, I get, I'm like, why didn't I just, like, learn how to sing, like, like in a lower register, and I could, <laughs> I could smoke weed, and like Willie yeah. Nelson, and fucking... You're like a fucking chainsaw, <laughs> man. I had, to, I, had to, I had to fucking push my shit to the top of my range, and make it so difficult that I had to have all this shit going on just to pull it off, you know, but right. whatever, it's it's what I am, and... and um, it's work. Your stuff's hard. You know? I've tried to do some of your songs, <laughs> like karaoke, and at the end of it, I'm just like, somebody give me a shot of Jaeger, some rubber time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's how do you, a, how do you, you get the growl and the and the screams uh, without pushing a lot of things? A, a lot of practice, first of all. That's one thing. Like, if you're going to sing a song, make sure you know the song. Because you can sing the song so much better and hit the notes better if you know the song. Like, where you don't have to think about it. So, know the lyrics. Know them like the back of your hand. Know the melodies, the pitch. I mean, do mental rehearsals. Listen to it. Look at the words. Remember the words. Listen to it. Keep doing it. Then sing it. And, you know, and then re-sing it. And really prepare yourself for by the time that you work up to being in front of people. Because when you're in front of people, it doesn't matter how many times you nailed it right here with nobody around. It brings this extra element. You know, there, your nerves are high. There's adrenaline. There's all this shit. So you need to learn. If you know it like the back of your hand, it becomes much yeah. easier live. You know what I mean? I find the delivery and the cadence is probably like I try. I do a lot of Bowie songs, and the way he like dances through the lyrics, you don't even yeah. know what he's saying. But as long as you have the cadence down, it works. Well, it's all rhythm, you know. Like I, I try to teach that to my eleven-year-old daughter. My kids will be here at some point, but like she sings, and when we work on songs, I go listen to the beat. Oh, all these syllables are working off the beat. You know what I mean? Like everything is in time, so. Make all your stuff in time. Listen to the beat. I'm a very rhythmic singer. If I, I got to hear the drums. I want to hear the drums louder than the guitar because I, it, everything works off the beat. When you're on the beat, it's much easier to sing. So easy to sing when you're hitting that perfect rhythm of the song because all the syllables and the jive and the rhythms, they all go with the beat. All the shit. If you start listening to it, all that ACDC shit, all the fucking pop shit, all the R&B, James Brown, all that shit. It's all to the beat, you know, so that's all I encourage you to, like, break it down like that. Um, what else? Singing sick. That's an art form. You know, like, I'm a huge motorsports fan, so racing in the rain is a lot different than racing when the sun's out, right? So I like to think about that, you know, so I got really good at singing sick. Because I had to, for for monetary reasons. I didn't. I didn't. I don't want to like not make my money because I'm out there hustling. I'm away from my family. I'm making this sacrifice. I don't want to fucking cancel shows. You know what I mean? So, and I don't want to sound like shit. So I had this dilemma when it became like, oh fuck, I got a cold. Well, it, you know, anytime you get sick, it's two weeks. Two weeks, you're not gonna feel. You're not gonna have your voice. It's not. You're not gonna have your voice for two weeks. And that just depends on whatever you're dealing with. So, very easy to sing through a cold. Very easy. You know, you can get over-the-counter shit. I, I get, like, um, I get Dayquil, and I could have a fucking stuffed-up, packed-up nose, and I take Dayquil fucking an hour before I go on, and it just, like, 
it's got speed in it too. It's like get y'all fucking <laughs> pumped up, dries your shit up, and you know, hey, it's not your it's not your uh, voice that you're comfortable with, but you can deal with it, right? You can get through a show, and you can do it well, and nobody knows. And one thing I like to tell people is, if you're sick, don't tell the audience you're sick. Just don't, because they're don't there. Excuses, yeah. They're there to have a good time. A lot of them are fucked up. That you know, they just want to fucking get away from their situation. Some of them, this is all they got for the month. You know, they got this extra money. They've been wanting to see you for a fucking month. Don't tell them you're sick. You know, I I learned that from a tour manager a long time ago. Like I and I'm only telling you this because I've done it. You know, and he's like, hey, don't tell people you're sick. Is just no. You're there. You're putting on the show. Once you once you get on that stage, that's it. And I go, thank you. You know, I didn't know that. I so. He's right, you know. You there, man up and get through it. And let me tell you something. I've been, I've been, I've been in Europe, uh, getting ready backstage. Thousands of people warming up, and all of a sudden, I occasionally I get migraine headaches, right? And I don't know if you guys have ever had migraines, yeah. but if you have, you get this fucking crazy shit in your uh, peripherals, right? And then this massive headache and. And when I feel it coming on, like, I have to have Advil on me at all times. So I felt it coming on, and I'm like, fuck, I've never had that situation walking before walking on stage. So I popped four Advil, because that's what I do whenever I have, whenever I feel, if, you, if I can get it when it's doing this shit before it gets fucking really gnarly, if I just pop four Advil, then I can muscle through it. But I went on stage, and I figured out, like, when I did that, I would, I would I, you know, I do... We'll talk about exercise, but I, I do boxing exercise. So I got myself sweating before I went on, like a sweating, so that all this oxygen rushed to my head and everything, and so I didn't have like this massive headache. And and I did the show, and it was like I was like, oh, put that in a fucking bag of tricks mentally, you know, like okay, I can do that if that ever happens again, you know. I go through all this mental shit. Of some, one time I got a migraine when I was on stage, started vomiting after uh, when I went off for encore because it was like literally like it felt like a fucking like after it, it literally I walked on stage one song started coming on by song six it felt like there was a fucking uh, sword going through my head it was so fucking painful and and uh, but finished the show and that's that so that was brutal but anyways back to like being sick I'm talking a lot but uh I've been on stage with bronchitis, with fucking strep throat, with uh, with a full blown cold, everything. F- hopped up on antibiotics, everything you can think of, and I've gotten to the other side. Seventy percent sometimes, fifty percent sometimes, but gracefully and got through it. And people were happy, and I fucking hated it, and I went to sleep. You know what I mean? But you can get through it. You know. I just saw this thing they were talking about. If you get like a ear piercing, have you seen that article? It's a thing about people with migraines, and if you get like this part of your ear pierced, it's supposed to make <laughs> it go away. I don't know. It was, I saw it on like 2020. Look into it. But yeah, some All right. kind of well, crazy shit. Something else that said that actually it only works for a few months, and then they come back even oh, worse. Really? Yeah, but oh. yeah, that well, okay. I don't have them a lot. It's, it has to do with uh, a lot of like stress, and occasionally I will abuse caffeine. So. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, um, what else? What else I was I going to do? I'm not a singer, but I've seen you perform a lot, and the other singers. When you're energy, you're always running and jumping up and down and dancing. How do you maintain? How do you keep your breath? Because I know when I work out, I can't. I, I wouldn't be able to sing. Right. How, how do you do all that and <clears throat> keep your breath? Yeah, it's about like that's a great question. Um, when you uh, start singing and you, you dedicate yourself to your craft, and that's what I like to think. This is my craft. This is I am my instrument. So you got to think about that. You got to think like if you're a guitar player, you would practice your guitar every day if you wanted to be great, right? And you would tune your guitar before a show, make sure it was perfectly in tune. And that's the same thing with you got to prepare yourself. You got to work up to the show. This, you take all these steps before the show actually happens. You know that's what you have to. Um, be aware of so to answer your question um, every day I work out I work out on show days 30 minutes but I go hard 30 minutes 
where I'm resting no longer than 40 seconds in 30 minutes. And then a lot of it's cardio, push-ups, sit-ups, boxing, you know, the jumping rope and stuff like that. So whatever you like to do. But uh, getting cardio for a singer is like so important because you're using your wind to hit your voices, your notes, you're using your wind to move around to entertain an audience. And like she was saying, it's like, what I do is I try to, and I learned this from James Brown, like watching James Brown, like, like he does it, he's, he's dancing all, all the fucking time, bah, he's hitting it, boom, and then dancing, and then hitting a note, boom, boom. I love the way he set up his career because it's perfect, he, he hits a few notes, and then he lets his voice rest, and he dances, and then he hits a few notes, and he's setting himself up to win, and I never did that, and a lot of pop artists aren't doing that either, that's why they gotta run fucking tracks live because they're not setting themselves up to win. They're going in the studio and they're running a vocal through the whole fucking track. They got no Overdone, fucking, yeah. there's no rest, there's no musical interlude, there's no fucking breath, you know? And um, so James Brown did it right, but what I try to do on stage is like explode and then get back in the pocket and, you know, do my verse, you know? And then explode on the, on the sections and then try to get like musical interludes and pick up my tambourine and use that as a situation, you know, and and just do whatever you can do, you know, learn how to dance, learn how to, to speak to an audience, be spontaneous, you know. There's nothing worse for me than watching a guy every night say the same shit between songs to everybody. Are you guys feeling good tonight? Can you raise your hand or make more noise when I raise my hand? Some bullshit like that, you know. I, just, I like to try to just be like, work off the cuff, you know, um, kind of know where I'm at. Spend the whole day going, where am I at? What's kind of the history of this place? What's going on around here today? Like, I'm in Wisconsin. They got fucking potatoes or whatever. And I'm not saying that's the thing, but I'm just saying, you know, try to, try to get a little information about the place you're playing so you can jive with the audience a little bit. You know, that's what I try to do. Um, and that's it. Any more questions? How, uh, how has the, uh, you mentioned stress, uh, you know, um, how has the, industry the record industry and how music's gone affected your stress and and the career because uh, it's a bitch you know well it's if you say it's a bitch then it's going to be a bitch you know so i don't i don't like to put that kind of shit out there you know i like to just come back to passion passion i didn't start this for all that shit you know you say that in the song too i didn't start this to fucking please some corporate fuckhead who's not out on the road doing what I'm doing, you know what I mean? So, it's a fine line between artists and industry. You gotta just know that they're on their side and you're on your side. And they got a situation and you got a situation. And if you can understand that, you're gonna be fine. But they come from a school where they think they know about music and they think they know what's going on and they wanna be a part of this piece of shit's life but as soon as they're not making them money, they don't give a fuck about you. So as long as you can just be okay with that and know that they're just a bank and that's it. And if you look at it like that, it's just a bank because that's all it is. It's a bank that it's really your money. You're, you're taking a loan from somebody who can kind of get your brand out there and get it going and then you got to hustle to make your brand flow. You know? So just kind of try to get a business thinking mind about it. You know, that's the tough part because a lot of artists, they don't want to think about the business. They want to, they think they get a record deal and things are happening. And, you know, they got a tour manager who's telling them where to be every fucking day. Hey, you got to be here at five, you're on stage at 10 and you got to do this press. And you're like, okay. And you know, you're fucking smoking dope and drinking and you're fucking chicks and you're doing whatever you do. It's like the rock star life that you dreamed about or whatever you think it is, right? And then you come home and you look at your statement and you're like, fuck. The manager's getting this, the fucking label's getting this, we're unrecouped here, and fucking, where's the money, you know? And so... I had to pay for the deli tray you didn't <laughs> So you gotta, like, um, pay attention to that or you're gonna get fucked, you know? And so my advice is just get a good attorney before you sign anything and, uh, you know, and just be smart. Try to be smart. What's the best part shit? about the whole thing for you is it... Just um, you know, know what you're gonna do and go out and, and play in shows. Or what do you look forward to? You look forward to just staying at home with your family and writing music and coming up with something new to take to the studio. What's what's better for you, live or or working on producing something? 
in the studio uh, because they're they're totally different. Every everything's a, a different thing. Like um, I really enjoy writing a song, a good song, okay. finding a good song. Okay, that's really hard and it takes a lot of time and um, it takes a lot of practice. You know, um, I write all my lyrics and melodies. I've done it since I was. Since I started this, that's, that's what I've always done, you know, and I worked really hard um, writing a lot of shitty songs to get to this place where I know when a song sucks before it actually gets out, at least my version of suck, before it gets out, you know, to the public, you know, so um, you got to write and rewrite songs, you got to get frustrated, you got to get pissed off, you got to have breakthroughs, you got to dig deep, you know, all these things come from writing songs but uh, you know if it's a labor of love if it's you know if you're passionate about it then you're gonna get there because you're gonna not stop till you get what you need to get and that's the way I look at it you know you got to be really driven especially today in this business because a lot of the money has been removed so if you're not driven if you're not passionate about this being a singer or playing a guitar or whatever then do something else you know because it's it takes a lot of fucking follow through. What's up? Well, no, I was going to ask a question. You're talking about songwriting. Uh, technique, right? It, right. It, 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 you know, do you, or maybe you use all of them, but like, do you start with, you know, a lyrical idea, or maybe a subject matter, or do you ever get even, I, mean, I don't know if you play any instruments, but do you get maybe a melody in your head and you kind of, you know, write with that? So is there a technique or? Yes, that's a great question. I do play instruments, uh, an instrument. I play guitar. Um, I'm not a a uh, lead guitar player or a great guitar player, but enough to write songs and chords, and I taught myself that when I was younger. But that's not how I usually write songs. I, I write songs with my voice. Like, I can sing you a melody, and then as far as like how I want it to go, Michael Jackson did this a lot too. He would walk in a room and go, I want the, I want the horns to sound like this, and he would sing the horn part, and then he would sing the fucking guitar part, and he would go into all these different <coughs> rooms, and but I was obsessed with Thriller because I was like, fucking this record like, is just ridiculous. If you ever listen to Thriller on the headphones, like Quincy Jones is an amazing producer, but like everything that happened with that record, it's like, wow, <coughs> it blows me away. And I've like labored over that record, like um, analyzing it. Um, but uh, so a lot of times uh, a song, songs come all different ways. Sometimes I'll get music and it'll inspire I, I just I listen to it for a second and and just kind of think about where it's taking me, you know, like what kind of emotion am I getting from it? If it's a really heavy song and it's fucking crazy, like we have a song called Year of the Tiger on my new record, Josh Todd and the Conflict, Year of the Tiger, it came out today, but we had this song called Year of the Tiger and it was just reckless and fucking off the fucking chain and as soon as I heard it, I sometimes I compile a list of titles, so I go on my iPhone, and I read a lot, so I encourage people, like, if, if you're a lyric writer, read books, because it's storytelling. So you should be reading all the time, you know? And if you don't like to read, get into reading, you know? Like, start reading stuff and see how people put together a story and make it compelling <coughs> enough for you to want to finish a fucking book. Because to me, that's, like, extraordinary. Like, to put together 500 pages and keep me there. Like, I can't believe people do this. It's, like, it's so fascinating to me. So. I'll be reading a book and I'll go, this is how Year of the Tiger came about. I don't even know, I can't even remember what book I was reading, um, but Year of the Tiger was in the book and I just loved it and I wrote it down. I have this title folder in my iPhone. So I got the, I got the music, started thinking about the emotion. Uh, I kept locking on that title. I'm like, it's such a great fucking title and I love great titles, you know, things. And so I started kind of thinking about what I wanted it to be, you know, and I'm a huge fan of like, um, Hannibal and Narcos and these shows, right? And um, there was this despicable character in Hannibal that would feed these people to his pigs, right? And I thought, that is so fucked up, right? And then I thought, it, and, I, and I love the animal kingdom. Like, I study it. I, I like watching stuff on the Congo and fucking Africa. And I'm just, like, so fascinated that everything has a fucking purpose in nature. It's so fascinating to me. And it's so fucking scary. It's like... We're at the top of the food chain, but most fucking living <coughs> creatures, every morning they're waking up, they're wondering if they're going to fucking die or what's going to happen today. Like, that, that's it. Like, they didn't get very little sleep, you know what I mean? So 
Um, I was thinking, what would be like the worst way to die? And I thought being mauled by a tiger would be crazy, you know? So I wrote the song kind of about that, about a guy who had burned all his bridges and I wrote it in the third person and he was on the run and these drug cartel got him and fed him to the tigers, you know? And so uh, that's what that song was about. Just to give you an example, but so there's all different kinds of ways to write songs. Uh, for instance, Rain is on the record. I was in the shower, I came up with this melody I always keep an iPhone outside the shower because I come up with a lot of melodies in the shower. I don't know why. It's somehow the water it clears your mind and seven stuff comes out. Seven is waterproof. So huh? Seven is waterproof. You can take it right in there. <laughs> oh, yeah? Okay. Um, so anyways, uh, came up with rain, melodies for the whole song. Went down, stairs, wrote it. And came in, sang how I wanted the song to go to, to my songwriting buddy, uh, my guitar player, Stevie D., and I said, I want it to be like, um, we will rock you type beat. I want to have a signature Brian May guitar solo in the, in the middle. I want to have hand claps. I want the whole thing. I want it to be heavy. It's got to have a lot of space and groove. And I go, put up a fucking tempo. So we found a tempo. And I sang the whole song down with no, f no uh, music, right? And so I come back the next day. He matches the key. He's got a couple chords he puts under it. And boom, the song writes itself. That happened very quickly. And that's our first single because it was a song that was always a first time listen to everybody we played it for. So sometimes songs come like that. Crazy Bitch came like that. It was very, very quick, you know? And then some songs are just a beating and like, I'll be like, okay, this is the third fucking verse I'm writing for this song and I never want to hear this fucking song again. And all of a sudden, <laughs> the verse pops, the song fucking sounds great, everybody likes it and you're like, fuck, thank God, you know? And, you know, that's the way it goes. So, so many songs that you did that turned out to be hits and you didn't think they would be or vice versa? I can tell you this. I used to be really afraid of like revisiting a song. I had this very closed-minded attitude like once it's done, it's done and I don't want to go back to it. I'm very impatient and I don't want to fucking do it. And then I just write a whole new song. So I put myself through a whole lot more work than I needed to do when I could just go, now I just do this. I go... The chorus is really good. All this other stuff sucks. It doesn't set, it's not setting up the chorus. So I'll go back and revisit it. But I gotta take a couple days from it because I've labored over it. I don't wanna fucking hear it for a second. Then in two, two more days, it'll be eating at me, eating at me, and I'll get back to it and revisit it and then I'll have some new, fresh take on it because I left it alone for a second and tended to something else. That's happened a lot. Sometimes it'll be a verse that's good. The only thing I like about this song is the verse. The verse is good, I love the music, but I can't stand what I fucking wrote. So then, same thing. Just go back, beat it in shape until you either say, I'm, I'm done, or this is great, you know? I remember it was kind of like family movie night at my house. The first time I heard you, and I was sitting there watching Talladega Nights. <laughs> <laughs> Ricky Bobby's doing donuts. Yeah, yeah. I hear that, I go, whoa, shut the fuck up. And I was like, back it up, I was like, Who's singing that? Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's the yeah. first time I Lit up, right? Lit up was yeah. lit up. Yeah. Was like, Thank you. I was like, that's badass. Yeah, that's <laughs> how I tracked you down. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. That song wrote, we wrote real quick. I came in the rehearsal room, everybody's yeah, playing lit up. As shit. I was like, this is yeah. great. I just started scatting that melody, recorded it. I always have, always have a recorder with you. Recorded it, went home, wrote about the first time I did cocaine. That was it, you know? I, lit a, I, I did a uh, parody of that called Rogaine. There you go. Let me just tell you what our record label tried to do when that, when that song was, when we were talking about that song being a single. Well, we, we want to put it on the radio, but can you change the lyrics? And I said, no. And they said, okay, well, can you have it say, like, I love the Coltrane, I love that. And I was like, are you serious? They were serious, like, really serious. And I go... Well, they, like they, they, won't, like, they won't play that in the casino. To, to it got all the way. It got all the way down to they were doing research on how many times cocaine was said on the radio, and we found out that Eric Clapton had some cocaine in his song, and that it was played a lot, and that was enough for them to go, okay, we'll go to radio with that, and it was like smoking oh, whiskey, wow. you know, thank God, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing with Crazy Bitch. They they made us try to ruin that song, you know. But, but it's a staple at all the titty bars now. You know, if you would have caved in or they would have edited that because, I mean, I'd I wouldn't be here. You know, 
Yeah. It just that's what would happen. No one would have related to it, and you know. But how the connection get made with the movie? I mean, did they hear the song then call that, you that's or like, the uh, the management up and, and say, "Hey, can we use this?" I don't know how that song got placed. That's okay. what you're talking about. So. I had a publishing deal at that time okay. where your publishing publisher comes in they take a piece of your publishing they give you some money and you're like alright I'll do that and then you don't see that money for a long time but anyways publishers they, they get these songs and then they place them in movies TVs okay. and so that was like a nice surprise okay. I don't know if it was the publisher or DreamWorks did that but yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah it's awesome um, first of all thanks for being here thanks love yeah. your voice <laughs> love you know my pleasure. Stuff you've done. I love talking about the voice because cool. you know. Um, so I'm not a vocalist. I in this is my son, and he's oh, starting to sing cool. more than I am. But a lot of the stuff we're listening to is like this is kind of a random question, but it's you know the Swedish death metal stuff. Yeah. Or, and what I wonder is because you're such a great vocalist, do those people like do you see that they actually sing if it's like an arch enemy or a no? They're singing dancer? through those processors that make them sound like the devil. Is that pretty much right? the way it works out. I mean, that's what I've seen with them. There's some people right. that can do that, and I don't know how they do it, okay. and they don't hurt themselves, but um, yeah. I, I always wondered what good singers thought of those singers. <laughs> there are certain people that are just genetically, you know, yeah, predisposed they, to be yeah, right. predisposed to just like, fuck, they can just put themselves through hell their whole lives, and they never run into issues. Just, you know, not the case with me. I have to really work on it, you know, and most people that are doing it this far, long, you know, they, they have to work on it because it gets uh, weaker. Are you, are you from here? I am. Born and raised you? in California, Southern California. Okay. Orange know. County. So yeah, yeah. I, I found out that you were at the, uh, you played with Dick Mayberry and some of the other guys that did lit up over here on the other side last time you were here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, see, I didn't know you were here. I would have come out. Oh, just, yeah. Just for you. Because, no. I mean, to me, you're like, you, <laughs> watch, a lot of, you watch a lot of, um, you know, concerts and on stage, you're like the most stripped down, raw, real rock and roll version of. I mean, it's real. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, that's what attracts me. I didn't recognize him with a surf shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I took my sixty year old dad to watch you in the pouring rain at uh, Carolina Rebellion. Everybody talks about that show. He's, like, he's well, he's actually almost seventy. But he came walking up that hill. It was like pouring rain. They had the leaf blowers out there on the stage while you were playing. Yeah. It just to see so it didn't slip. Yeah. My dad was out there and he goes, Man, that guy's awesome at the F word. That's all he said. He said, Man, he's got it down pat. This, this show he's speaking about, the Car Carolina Rebellion, was this giant festival, right? And a huge rainstorm came in, and all these bands wouldn't play live except like. There's a handful of us, you know, and we went up there and it was just like pouring rain and we were fucking, you know, doing it. And like to this day, I have people bring that up, you yeah. know, that aren't even, in, you know, a lot of bands. Yeah, that stuff sticks. I yeah. mean, you got up there, you did it. I yeah. saw I mean, Tesla play in South Dakota at Sturgis in a windstorm, yeah. and their fucking amps blew over, and the, the, the techs are trying to hold the cymbals, and, and they're like, fuck it, we're playing. And it was like a... <laughs> I was like, I got so much more respect for him after yeah, that. Yeah, he was because, playing, and the, the guys were out there with the squeegees on the floor, taking yeah. the water off the stage, leaf blowers, everything. I mean, he was just kicking it. Well, thank yeah. you for keep doing it. Good job. Oh, yeah, I've seen you uh, so many times. I saw you in the little coming to the club thing in Long Beach. To, uh, yeah, yeah. to where you guys are, you know, where you're at now, the 15th album when you played before Steel Panther or whatever they were back then. Um, you're still amazing, dude. You're Thank still you. out there killing it, and I really appreciate it. And even hearing what you're doing for yourself and putting on through your vocals and stuff, because I wonder how the hell you do it, because you guys are road dogs. You've been out there yeah. for so many, you know, God bless you for keeping out there. I'm looking forward for the new album and, you know, for I'm a first day buyer of all your stuff, so. Thanks. Thanks for having Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having right. Keep doing it. Hell yeah. Do you, do you ever uh, you ever get sick of doing the hit songs like fuck we gotta do that song again <laughs> um no I try to like you know make them interesting like you know I don't know if you guys have seen us live a lot but we'll do like an eight minute version of like crazy bitch yeah. and a lot of amps and sometimes we'll go into like you know a little you know Keep it do a medley of stuff and and I always thought that was so you could see what all the audience was doing during that song. Well, oh, you know everybody's waiting for it. You know, all the chicks, are, everybody's 
just yeah. wait, they're like waiting for it because you know if, if you do There's it. There's been then... a lot of nonsense going on during that. Song. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. It's like you know. That and Girls, Girls, Girls are the two best titty bar songs. <laughs> right there. That's cool. I'm glad, glad to be in that uh, yeah. mix. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's, that's, that's your rock and roll right there. That's partially responsible for us being together, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. And the, the, and the bathroom version of the video, that's the shit. Oh, yeah. I made music videos yeah. for 20 years, and I, I was oh, like, cool. man, I, wanna, I wanted to do... Uh, uh, Hell Yeah put out uh, a stripper song. Uh, and I, I was like, dude, I kept trying to get them to do it. I go, We're gonna, let's do it sort of like this crazy bitch video. And they're like, no, 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 we'll never get it played anywhere. We'll, you know. <laughs> I was like, dude, fuck TV. It's a hit on YouTube. And that's where the world is now. Yeah. Uh, it's a different world, though, like what, to hold what kids are into. You know, I just think the society, the society has gotten really sensitive. So you got to be very, very oh, careful. Yeah, you know? so People are okay. really sensitive. Um, which doesn't cater to my style of things, so you have to be really careful. But, um, you know, a lot of great rock records just came out. I'm, like, really excited about rock again. Like, I really love the new Manson record and, and Prophets of Rage, and, you know, yeah. it's, it's a fun, fun little time right now. Mm-hmm. For sure. It helps to be inspired, I guess. Absolutely. Get some other stuff out there, too. Yeah. So what are your plans after? I know you got the show tomorrow at the Roxy. After that, you playing locally? Oh, or sure. What do you got going on? Uh, we announced a tour. Um, I didn't know We're that. just getting the routing finished up, but uh, mid-October. Are you playing yep. the clubs, or are you playing supporting somebody? Or anyone else? Well, I can't say right now, but okay. we're going to be co-headlining with uh, some other bands, a couple a couple great bands, and cool. it's going to be fun. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'll see you when you roll back through Dallas. Okay. Mm-hmm. Great. Anybody have any other questions? And. My, uh, I appreciate your time. If anybody has anything for him to sign or want to take pictures, we can do that now, right? Sure, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. Greatly yeah, appreciate it. <laughs> this was awesome.